family values um, between neoliberalism and the new social conservatism by Melinda Cooper. This is part two of chapter two. Turning against the family wage, neoliberalism and neoconservatism come in, come into their own. Moynihan's trajectory from New Deal Democrat and supporter of the Great Society to New Social Conservative is in some sense emblematic of the birth of neoconservatism per se. In the optimistic atmosphere of the mid to late 1960s, Moynihan was willing to join forces with moderate conservatives such as Nixon in the hope of constructing a more inclusive family wage. Indeed, the alliance between New Deal Democrats and moderate conservatives under the early Nixon administration appeared to him to represent the most effective means of formulating a social welfare program that combined the goals of income redistribution with those of familialism. It was only after the defeat of the Family Assistance Plan that Moynihan became a recognizable neoconservative. Although the plan had been opposed from the left, and the right, and was defeated by Nixon himself, Moynihan placed the blame squarely on the shoulders of the countercultural new left. More precisely, he excoriated the radicalism of black women in the welfare rights movement, whom he perceived to be hostile to the moral premises of the Fordist family wage. Prefiguring the use of the soon-to-be ubiquitous term welfare queens, he dismissed the militant black mothers of the National Welfare Rights Organization as the aristocracy of welfare recipients and accused them of sabotaging a plan that would have benefited working families. Looking back on this period from the vantage point of, of the early nine, 1990s, Moynihan now conceded to his critics on the right that the Great Society had contributed to the disintegration of the American family. For a brief time, the Great Society gave great influence in social policy to viewpoints that rejected the proposition that family structure might be a social issue. Accordingly, even if social policy might have produced some effective responses, no such policies were attempted. In that sense, the current crisis of the family is indeed a grim harvest of the Great Society. The defeat of Nixon's black family wage, he concluded, sounded the death knell of the expansionary welfare politics of the 1960s. Without completely renouncing the principle of income redistribution, the neoconservatives now focused their energies on reviving the punitive and pedagogical function of welfare. Under the austerity politics of President Reagan, Moynihan abandoned his commitment to the Fortis family wage and instead campaigned for disciplinary reforms to AFDC that would encourage work and family formation among welfare recipients. Milton Friedman's change in position was no less decisive as a turning point in American neoliberalism. Throughout the 1960s, Friedman operated as a pragmatist who was willing to compromise on the shape of welfare reform for the sake of effecting some kind of positive change. By the end of the decade, his pragmatism was much less in evidence. In 1970, he testified against Nixon's family assistance plan in Congress, even though he had consulted on its implementation and had devised the negative income tax on which it was modeled. The negative income tax, he now argued, could only work if it completely replaced all other welfare, that is, social insurance and public assistance, programs, and as long as it did not undermine incentives to work. Friedman saw Nixon's final version of the family assistance plan as a messy compromise. In the meantime, Friedman was becoming increasingly disenchanted with Nixon himself, who had been elected on a platform of austerity and tight monetary policy, but proceeded to ignore the advice of monetarists once he came into office. In addition to the groundbreaking consumer and environmental protection laws introduced under his administration, Nixon also signed off on some of the most generous increases to Social Security in the program's history. Most galling of all, Nixon completely ignored Friedman's mon monetarist prescriptions for dealing with inflation and instead opted for a brief experiment in wage and price controls.
All of this led Friedman to dismiss Nixon, in hindsight, as the most socialist of the presidents of the United States in the 20th century. By 1980, Friedman's critique of welfare was much more vehement than it had been in the 1960s. In Free to Choose, he castigated welfare programs for destroying the moral fabric of the free market society. They weaken the family, reduce the incentive to work, save and innovate, reduce the accumulation of capital, and limit our freedom. More than one commentator on Friedman's intellectual trajectory has noted that he became increasingly libertarian in the 1970s. This apparent shift testified as much, if not more, to the change in public mood than to any vacillation on Friedman's part. Since Friedman had always qualified his support for redistributive welfare and acknowledged the pragmatism of his position, During the 1960s, Friedman went so far as to concede that we are all Keynesians now. By the early 1970s, Chicago school neoliberalism had come into its own and was willing to formulate an uncompromising argument against redistributive welfare per se. It was during the 1970s then, after the defeat of Nixon's family wage, that American neoliberalism and neoconservatism emerged as mature political philosophies with distinct positions on welfare reform. During this period, Chicago school neoliberals abandoned their pragmatic accommodation with the Keynesian welfare state and articulated a new and uncompromising position in favor of social spending cutbacks. Neoconservatism, for its part, emerged as a reaction against the new left. Although it never fully abandoned its root in New Deal liberalism, It was now prepared to promote family values without invoking the necessity of income redistribution. These positions were by no means equivalent. While neoliberals called for an ongoing reduction in budget allocations dedicated to welfare, intent on undercutting any possibility that the social wage might compete with the free market wage, neoconservatives endorsed an expanding role for the state in the regulation of sexuality. Despite their differences, however, neoliberals and neoconservatives converged on the necessity of reinstating the family as the foundation of social and economic order. Their alliance would profoundly shape the direction of social policy over the following decades, culminating in Clinton's radical welfare reform of 1996. The Rise of Neoconservatism, Inflation, Welfare, and Moral Crisis It is often forgotten today that the first wave of neoconservatives, those who grew up during the Cold War, were overwhelmingly concerned with domestic social welfare issues rather than foreign policy. Among this generation, some had been associated with the anti-Stalinist Trotskyist left in the 1930s. Almost all would later later become anti-communist liberals and New Deal Democrats during the Cold War. All were vehemently opposed to the anti-welfare politics of Republican conservatives, such as Barry Goldwater, whom the neoliberal Milton Friedman had supported, and none were as yet Republicans. Many of these figures were associated at one time or another with a public interest, a journal founded by Daniel Bell and Irving Kristol in 1965, and Commentary Magazine, first published in 1945, and edited by Norman Poderitz in the 1960s. By the time Bell and Crystal founded the public interest, they had long since renounced socialism and had, by the 1950s, morphed into New Deal liberals, critical of both the communist left and McCarthyism. In its first years of publication, the public interest presented itself as a venue for the perfection of nonpartisan social policy expertise. Its first few issues featured articles from across the policy spectrum and included contributions from scholars as diverse as Milton Friedman, James Tobin, and Daniel Patrick Moynihan. With few exceptions, these these contributors accepted the premises of the New Deal and, to a large extent, the Great Society welfare programs and merely applied themselves to the task of better implementing such programs. The tone was one of cautious technocratic optimism. By the late 1960s, however, the tone had become decidedly more pessimistic. In 
its authors more attuned to the dangers of unintended consequences and perverse incentives than the task of neutral policy implementation. Irving Kristol locates the birth of neoconservatism as a coherent tendency in 1965, the year in which the public interest first came into circulation, and Moynihan published his, repor his report on the African-American family. Certainly many of the names that would later be associated with neoconservatism appeared in the first few issues of the public interest, but Nathan Glazer is surely more accurate in locating the inflection points in the late 1960s, when these former Democrats and New Deal liberals turned decis decisively against the new left and began to formulate a coherent politics of reaction from within the left. Reflecting on the evolution of the public interest, Glazer traces the subtle shift in mood among the New Deal liberals as they moved from the optimism of the 1960s to the threat of looming inflation at the turn of the decade, and from a progressive consensus on welfare, embracing Democrats and moder moderate conservatives, to a growing sense of discomfort with the ideals of the new left. By the end of the 1960s, he writes, I was not alone in thinking that something had gone wrong, that we had been somewhat too optimistic. My insight, probably not original, derived entirely from my experiences with social policy, and not at all from reading any theorist or social philosopher, was, was that we seemed to be creating as many problems as we were solving, and that the reasons were inherent in the way we, liberals, but also moderate conservatives of the day, recall that they were such people as Richard Nixon and Nelson Rockefeller, thought about social problems and social policy. Reflecting, it seems, on the fate of Nixon's black family wage, Glazer echoed the sentiments of many of his colleagues, when he concluded that the social reform efforts of the left had done more to undermine the family than to save it. In our social policies, we are trying to deal with the breakdown of traditional ways of handling distress, such as the family, he remarked. But in our efforts to deal with the breakdown of these traditional structures, our, so our social policies are weakening them further and making matters in some important respects worse. By the late 1960s, even the most progressive of old Democrats and champions of the Great Society, a position exemplified by a figure such as Moynihan, were alarmed at the direction in which leftist welfare politics was heading. These future neoconservatives had supported the extension of the family wage to black men, but recoiled from redistributive welfare reform as such when they found themselves outflanked by a new and countercultural left. In particular, they were alarmed by those elements at the margins of the new left that questioned the very premise of the family wage. The notion, that is, that income redistribution should be linked to the normative policing of legitimate childbearing and sexual morality. As we have seen, this critique was extremely marginal, even among the most countercultural tendencies within the new left, and indeed within the welfare rights movement itself. Yet it was in reaction to this countercultural, and anti-normative left, a left that challenged the sexual foundations of the Fordist consensus, that neoconservatism was born. Reflecting on the concept of counterculture, Crystal noted that sexual liberation is always very near the top of a countercultural agenda. Women's liberation, likewise, is another consistent feature of all countercultural movements. Liberation from husbands, liberation from children, liberation from family. Indeed, the real object of these various sexual heterodoxies is to, de is to disestablish the family as the central institution of human society, the citadel of orthodoxy. But what did the neoconservatives mean by counterculture? The historian of neoconservatism, Justin Vase, describes the new left counterculture as primarily a phenomenon of the white educated middle class, who had time and money to spare. This new class of militants, composed for the most part of college students and anti-war protesters, reacted against the reformism of the civil rights movement and defined itself in opposition to both the blue-collar trade union movement and the lower middle-class whites who represented the core constituency of the Democratic Party. Yet Vase's characterization of the countercultural left relies heavily on neoconservatism's own denunciations of the new class, 
and it conflicts with other accounts of the shifting power relations within the left during the 1960s. Far from being confined to the white, college-educated middle class, the anti-authoritarianism of the counterculture reached far into the blue-collar labor movement during this period, provoking the president of the United Automobile Workers, Walter Ruther, to remark that official trade unionism would need to adapt itself to a very different kind of worker. The eruption of extra-legal wildcat militancy within the ranks of the labor movement was particularly disturbing to the neoconservative Samuel Huntington. As Huntington recognized, the anti-reformist spirit of the counterculture extended well beyond the white middle class to embrace blue-collar labor activism, black liberation, and the welfare rights movement, where it found expression in a newfound willingness to question the authority of the family as an instrument of social discipline. This perhaps explains why neoconservative, neoconservative denunciations of the counterculture tend to begin with general fulminations against the white, educated, and privileged student class, the new class, but just as insistently conclude with the figure of the black welfare recipient. In text after text, neoconservative critique of the counterculture somehow transmutes into a critique of AFDC, the welfare program that they perceived, no doubt correctly, as the linchpin of the Fordist social order, and a virulent attack on the activists whom they saw as most responsible for disestablishing this order. AFDC recipients could hardly be characterized as the most privileged of social subjects, and yet the neoconservatives con consistently describe welfare mothers as a non-productive rentier class a lumpen proletariat that has taken on the qualities of the idle aristocracy by virtue of its dependence on the unlearned income of welfare benefits. Neoconservative rhetoric caters to the resentment of Fordism's most protected workers by reversing the order of actual social hierarchy amongst the poor, presenting itself as the defender of the white blue collar working class against the demands of an unproductive rentier class of welfare queens a move that is characteristic of reactionary populism on both the left and right. If inflation had come to be associated in the popular imagination with the problem of sumptuary speculation, since everyday consumers had learnt that it was in their interests to buy on credit, the moral denunciations that accompanied this observation fell disproportionately on the shoulders of the non-working poor. The neoconservatives perfected their rhetoric of social disorder throughout the 1970s. As the problem of rising consumer prices impressed itself on the political agenda, the neoconservatives offered a comprehensive social theory of inflation that linked it, through sheer repetition as much as anything else, to the expansion of welfare programs, the breakdown of traditional values and the crisis of the family. Samuel Huntington's 1975 contribution to the Trilateral Commission report was one of the first to to posit a causal relationship between rising public deficits, inflation, and welfare spending that would soon accrue the aura of incontrovertible truth. Huntington noted that the immediate post-war years had seen a rapid increase in the proportion of government expenditures devoted to the military, but this defense shift was later superseded by a welfare shift that saw health, education, and income transfers compete with compete with and then outpace military spending after the Vietnam War. Reprinted in a special issue of the public interest, Huntington's report established the spurious but enormously influential argument that inflation could be attributed to, to budget deficits. Although through sleight of hand, inflation seemed to derive only from deficits accrued through social welfare spending, not from the profligate defense spending of the Cold War. Huntington's argument repeated in relentless detail by his neoconservative colleagues would prove decisive in shaping the future of government responses to inflation, not only under Reagan, but also under subsequent Democratic and Republican administrations. The neoconservatives added something new to the neoliberal argument outlined by Milton Friedemann in his Nobel Prize lecture of 1973, that stagflation had upset the quantitative calculus of Keynesian demand management, as embodied in the so-called Phillips curve. 
Huntington intimated that the crisis of inflation represented not only a quantitative shift in government social expenditures, but also a qualitative shift in the nature of social expectations, which undermined the very sources of authority on which the Keynesian social order had rested. The essence of the democratic surge of the 1960s, he wrote, was a general challenge to existing systems of authority, public and private. In one form or another, his challenge manifested itself in the family, the university, business, public and private associations, politics, the government bureaucracy and the military services. It was Daniel Bell, reputed to be the most progressive of the, of the neoconservatives, who would fully develop his argument in The Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism, first published in 1976. Here he accuses the Keynesian Re Revolution of undermining, through its very success, the principles of Protestant frugality upon which the modern fiscal state was originally based. The historical novelty of the Protestant ethic, according to Weber, was to combine a crematistics of the market with an austere philosophy of desire. One found on abstinence, deferred gratification, and frugality. If early modern capitalism promoted limitless accumulation in the market, it simultaneously imposed restraint on consumption. The welfare state, Bell argued, had reversed this logic by freeing welfare expenditure from all economic and moral constraints, and thereby unleashing a limitless drive to sumptuary accumulation in the private sphere. Little by little, the perverse logic of crematistics had shifted from the market to the workplace to the household, generating limitless desires that challenged the traditional order of sexual relations not to mention the fiscal viability of the state, which was now called upon to subsidize these non-normative ways of living. By pointing to the incompatibility between Keynesian deficit, spending, and sexual liberation, Daniel Bell elucidated what he saw as implicit within the American economics of public, public finance, telling, tellingly dubbed the economics of the public household by the economist Richard Musgrave. The calculus of post-war deficit spending was premised on the normative assumption of the family wage and therefore con contained within limits that were simultaneously sexual and economic. If one could imagine an expansion of welfare state spending to include non-white men within the category of breadwinner, one could not question the normative premise of the male breadwinner family itself without completely defeating the arithmetic uh, arithmetic of the public household and thus generating runaway in inflation. The thrust of Bell's argument, which in the last instance attributes inflation to a breakdown of household order, helps to explain why the neoconservatives were almost exclusively preoccupied by a welfare program that consumed so little of the overall social welfare budget. Huntington may have identified the welfare shift, by which he meant the expansion of all social programs, from health and education to social insurance and public assistance programs, as the source of inflation. But time and again, neoconservative attacks on welfare home, in well on welfare homes, in on AFDC in particular, and on AFDC in particular. Nathan Glazer recognizes the apparent contradiction here when he concedes that welfare, AFDC, was far from the biggest of our social programs, and no great drain on our financial resources compared with other large social programs. Yet he goes on to argue, it was seen, and with good reason, I would argue, as being closer to the heart of our social problems than larger programs such as Social Security, or Aid to the Disabled, or Medicare, or Medicaid. Inflation could not reasonably be attributed to the quantitative increase in AFDC roles then, but it could well be associated with the qualitative shift in moral expectations that allowed AFDC recipients to flout the norms of the Fortis family. Having established that inflation was a problem of effective expectations rather than quantitative laws, the neoconservatives could confidently identify, identify AFDC as symptom and cause of the crisis of inflation, 
Of all the New Deal and Great Society social initiatives, AFDC was the one program that contributed to the breakdown of the traditional family and therefore the program that was directly expressed, that most directly expressed the moral malaise of inflation. Neoconservatism and Neoliberalism How did neoliberals and neoconservatives manage to form an alliance on social welfare despite seemingly insurmountable political and epistemological differences? Irving Kristol candidly acknowledged these tensions when he was invited to deliver a paper at the 25th anniversary meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society in 1972. The paper was written at the request of Milton Friedemann, who was then presiding over the organization and hoped by inviting Crystal to rekindle some of its earlier pluralism. Despite Friedemann's overtures, however, Crystal was skeptical of any continued alliance between free market economics and neoconservatism, bluntly accusing the neoliberals of continuing to fight a battle they had already won. As politicians contemplated the incapacity of orthodox Keynesian economics to cope with the novel economic conditions of the 1970s, the once marginal prescriptions of monetarist, monetarists such as Friedemann had now become increasingly respectable. In the meantime, however, the neoliberals were ignoring what to Crystal was the more pressing problem of the countercultural left, which he saw as hostile to the very values of bourgeois society on which a free market order depended. In Crystal's eyes, neoliberalism was incapable of countering the rising tide of the counterculture because it shared the new left's essential amoralism. The neoliberal ethos propounded by a Friedemann or a Becker, who at various moments would contemplate consumer markets in kidneys, babies, and drugs, was ultimately compatible with the anti-normative desires of the new left because it accepted no a priori notion of transcendent virtue. For neoconservatives such as Crystal, by contrast, the free market order propounded by neoliberals could not exist without the assumption of some fundamental moral value. In Crystal's words, the idea of bourgeois virtue has been eliminated from Friedemann's conception of bourgeois society and has been replaced by the idea of individual liberty. Crystal's account of neoliberalism's amoralism is one that might be readily endorsed by commentators on the left, but it fails to do justice to the nuance of the neoliberal position, which does not so much eliminate moral philosophy as posit an imminent ethics of virtue and a spontaneous order of family values that it expects to arise automatically from the mechanics of the free market system. Much like Crystal, critics of neoliberalism have failed to recognize that Friedemann and his Chicago school colleagues posit the self-sufficient family as much as the individual, as a basic manifestation of the free market order. Gary Becker makes this point explicitly when he argues that the familial incentive toward altruism is essential to the constitution of the free market as the utilitarian incentive of self-interested exchange. The nature of family altruism in some sense represents an internal exception to the free market, an imminent order of non-contractual obligations and inalienable services without which the world of contract would cease to function. This premise is so constitutive of economic liberalism, both classical and neoliberal, that it is rarely articulated as such. Yet it explains why, in Wendy, Wendy Brown's words, private family values constitute the secret underside of liberal contractualism. Milton Friedemann, for his part, assumes the nuclear family is a natural or spontaneous state of the uncorrupted social in much the same way as he posits an equilibrium state of money. In its free or equilibrium state, money appears so neutral as to exert no power at all on the actual workings of economic exchange. Money is merely a veil that permits the proper unfolding of contractual relations. But in the same way that the Federal Reserve may intervene to distort the natural rate of growth of the money supply, giving rise to such perverse consequences as inflation, excessive government spending on welfare upsets the equilibrium state of the family and undermines its natural incentives toward altruism and mutual dependence. Pointing to the example of Social Security, which Friedemann would like to see privatized in its entirety, he notes that the natural obligations of kinship that once compelled children to look after their parents, 
in old age have now been replaced by an impersonal system of social insurance whose long-term effect is to usurp the place of the family. The difference between social security and earlier arrangements is that social security is compulsory and impersonal. Earlier arrangements were voluntary and personal. Moral responsibility is an individual matter, not a social matter. Children helped their parents out of love or duty. They now contribute to the support of someone else's parents out of compulsion and fear. The earlier transfers strengthen the bonds of the family. The compulsory transfers weaken them. In a true free market order, Friedman argues economic security would ideally derive from the familial transmission of property rather than state-based redistribution. The freedom to bequeath wealth to one's children should therefore be understood as a natural, spontaneous incentive of the free market order and protected from any kind of state confiscation in the form of an estate tax. This is really a family society, not an individual society, and the greatest incentives of all, the incentives that have really driven people on, have largely been the incentives of family creation. The thing that is amazing that people don't really recognize is the extent to which the free market system has in fact encouraged people and enabled people to work hard and sacrifice in what I confess I often regard as an irrational way for the benefit of their children. One of the most curious things to me in, ob in observation is that almost all people value the utility their children will get from consumption higher than their own. That was a quotation. A similar intuition underlies and informs Becker's entire theory of human capital investment, which can be read as a systematic historical comparison of the effects of state versus family investment in the welfare of children. Becker begins his treatise on the family by noting that the family in the Western world has been radically altered, some claim almost destroyed, by events of the last three decades. He goes on to list a familiar series of ills, from the rapid rise in divorce rates in female-headed families to the decline in birth rates and the growing labor force participation of married men, which has reduced the contact between children and their mothers and contributed to the conflict between the sexes in employment as well as in marriage. These dramatic changes in the structure of the family, he argues, have more to do with the expansion of the welfare state in the post-war era than with feminism, per se, which can be considered a consequence rather than instigator than an instigator of these dynamics. Predictably, Becker singles out AFDC, the poor woman's alimony, as one of the prime culprits in the breakdown of the family. But like Friedemann, he also credits more generic social insurance programs and public services, such as state education with weakening the bonds of familial obligation. For Becker, the family in its equilibrium state can be understood as serving a kind of natural insurance function, that is disturbed when the welfare state socializes insurance. The fact that fathers choose to support wife and children and mothers choose to perform most of the unpaid reproductive work of care, thus relieving the state of any such responsibilities, represents the equilibrium state of the family in a free market order, a state of mutual dependence and self-sufficiency that neoliberal welf welfare reform must strive to restore. If we can therefore derive a pragmatic policy lesson from neoliberalism's philosophy of the family, it is that the dismantling of welfare represents the most effective means of restoring the private bonds of familial obligation. Writing in the early 1980s, Becker credits the post-war welfare state with destroying the natural altruism of the family, but surmises that the decline in welfare initiated by Regan will ultimately compel the poor to restore the bonds of kinship, as a source of privatized welfare. It is not that neoliberals completely reject the idea of virtue then, as Crystal wants to argue, but rather that they expect the strictest of virtue ethics to arise spontaneously from the imminent action of market forces. Economic systems that rely on private behavior and competitive markets are more efficient than those with extensive government control, writes Becker. However, the effects of a free market system on self-reliance, initiative, and other virtues may be of even greater importance in the long run. This, he explains, is why 19th century defenders of the free market often emphasize the system's effect on values rather than on efficiency, predictably going on to quote Tocqueville on the mutually reinforcing relationship between self-interest and virtue. Thus, if neoliberals can, in one 
respect be described as laissez-faire on the question of family in the sense that they believe that cutbacks in government social spending will automatically restore the natural virtues of kinship obligations. This does not make them any less concerned with the necessity of family in a free market order. It simply means that they theorize fundamental value itself as the emergent effect of market forces, rather than its a priori foundation. For the neoconservatives, by contrast, the ideal family is not the natural result of market forces, but an institution that in some sense opposes the market and lies outside it. Its fundamental values must be actively protected by the state if it is to survive the corrosive force of contractual exchange. In this respect, neoconservatives appear much closer to left social democrats such as Karl Polanyi than they do to neoliberals. Most of them, after all, continue to support the basic functions of the welfare state in an era when neoliberal arguments in favor of small government were otherwise on the ascendant. Even Irving Kristol, among neoconservatives, the most sympathetic to the free market ideas of Ronald Reagan, insisted that neoconservatism feels no lingering hostility to the welfare state, nor, nor does it accept it resignedly as a necessary evil. Instead, it seeks not to dismantle the welfare state in the name of free market economics, but rather to reshape it so as to attach to it the conservative predispositions of the people. Much to the chagrin of the libertarian and neoliberal right, neoconservatives such as Crystal were happy to endorse the expansion of Social Security, Friedemann's Bete Noire, because it supported such a benign constituency, the elderly, or constituency, the elderly. Crystal even declared himself in favor of universal health insurance. If the neoconservatives nevertheless directed so much of their cr critical energy towards AFDC, it was because it had abandoned the punitive and pedagogical function of the early mother's pensions programs and had instead come to subsidize immorality. Importantly, however, they never rejected AFDC outright, but instead called for a new kind of public assistance program that would actively promote marriage and legitimate childbearing among the poor. Um, among the poor... At first blush, then, neoconservatives and neoliberals would seem to endorse diametrically opposing positions on the role of the state in welfare reform. The neoconservatives are under no illusion that the traditional family will simply reassert itself of its own accord, absent government intrusion. Rather, they see the primary function of the state as that of sustaining the family, the foundation of all social order, if necessary, through the use of force. Social conservative policy practitioners such as the new paternalist Lawrence Mead thus develop an elaborate and explicit methodology of power that tells us just how the non-contractual virtues of work and family are to be imposed. In the words of Nathan Glazer, the task of neoconservative welfare reform is to reinvent tradition by actively inculcating a culture of abstinence, monogamy, and marriage among the poor. Neoliberals instead envisage the private paternalism of the family as a spontaneous source of welfare in the free market order, a state of equilibrium that may be disturbed by the perverse incentives of redistributive welfare, but also restored through the diminution of state paternalism. In its mature articulation, the neoliberal agenda for welfare reform calls for the ongoing reduction of redistributive expenditures, the outright elimination of superfluous programs the contracting out of social services <coughs> to private providers, the replacement of dedicated government services by a voucher system that can be used to simulate, <coughs> to simulate private markets and consumer choice, and the devolution of welfare provision from the federal government to the state and local levels. In the long run, neoliberals hope that many of the functions formerly usurped by the welfare state will be returned to the private family, which they expect to automatically resume its traditional role in the provision of care. In the medium term, however, they readily acknowledge the reality of family failure, homologous to market failure, and the necessity of some kind of restorative intervention on the part of the state to correct such disorders. In these instances, their first impulse is to invoke incentives as the most efficient form of intervention.
modeled on the price signaling mechanisms of the market, incentives such as fines, sanctions, and rewards are designed to correct the perverse incentives of voluntary unemployment and family dysfunction with as little effort as possible on the part of the state. Thus, Becker recommends the use of performance-linked benefits incentivizing parents to send their children to school. Keep up with vaccinations and stop them from taking drugs. When even the harshest of incentives fail to work, however, neoliberals have in practice relied on the much more overt forms of behavioral correction favored by social conservatives. Although they rarely acknowledge or theorize this imperative, neoliberals must ultimately delegate power to social conservatives in order to realize their vision of a naturally equilibrating free market order in a spontaneously self-sufficient family. Neoliberalism and social conservatism are thus tethered together by a working relationship that is at once necessary and disavowed. As an ideology of power that only ever acknowledges its reliance on market mechanisms and their homologues, neoliberalism can only realize its objectives by proxy, that is, by outsourcing the imposition of non-contractual obligations to social conservatives. In extremists, neoliberals must turn to the overt neoconservative methodology of state-imposed transcendent virtue to realize their dream of an imminent virtue ethics of the market. Transitions. The inflation of the 1970s oversaw a, profo- oversaw a profound reshuffling of political alignments. In the 1960s, New Deal Democrats and free market neoliberals alike were contemplating the expansion of the family wage to include African American men with the active support of a Republican president. Democrats and Republicans proclaimed themselves all Keynesians now as redistributive welfare imposed itself at the starting point random hiccup, and horizon of all social reform. By the mid-1970s, however, Nixon had secretly given up on the black family wage, and inflation now emerged as an overwhelming political concern. In this new context of diminished expectations, former New Deal Democrats such as Moynihan came out as recognizable neoconservatives while free market neoliberals such as Milton Friedman lost any pragmatic adherence to the precepts of income redistribution. These former champions of New Deal liberalism now accused AFDC, and by extension the welfare state itself, of radically undermining the family. And in response to what they perceived as the incorrigible perversion of the great society social state, they now called for a much more drastic reform of welfare than they themselves had hitherto imagined. It was now agreed that the welfare programs of the New Deal and Great Society would need to be radically restricted and qualified, even while the private institution of the family was to be strengthened as a general alternative to redistributive welfare. Family responsibility, a notion derived from the poor law tradition of public relief, now became the watchword of neoliberal and neoconservative efforts to reform the welfare state. One figure who was poised to benefit from this shifting political configuration was Ronald Reagan, who, as governor governor of California, had taken an active stance against Nixon's family wage. In 1975, the governor's office of California, under Reagan's influence, published the document California's Blueprint for National Welfare Reform, which articulated a new Republican right agenda for social policy that stood in sharp contrast to Nixon's moderate moderate liberalism. The blueprint recommended the implementation of a comprehensive workfare program and was one of the first policy documents to weave together the neoliberal thematics of family self-sufficiency with a neoconservative agenda of moral reform. This combination of influences would come into its own under the impetus of the Volcker shock and prove and proved decisive in shaping the future of welfare reform over the following decades. Hoping to replicate his state experiment in welfare reform at the federal level, Reagan initiated his presidency by announcing his intention to cut spending across all social programs. The resulting budget plan contained in the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1981, OBRA, cut AFDC roles by 400,000 individuals, $2.5 
reduced benefits for hundreds of thousands more and cut federal AFDC costs by $1 billion, or 12%, in fiscal year 1982, but left much more costly programs such as Social Security, Medicare for the elderly, and veterans' benefits virtually untouched. As noted by Marissa Chappell, a surely economic perspective on Regan's anti-inflationary politics cannot account for the disproportionate share of budget cuts inflicted on AFDC, a program that consumed mere 1% of the federal budget. The focus of these cuts can only be understood if we appreciate the sense of moral crisis that had accrued around the AFDC program in the preceding decade. In the eyes of both neoliberals and neoconservatives, AFDC had come to epitomize the specific moral malaise of inflation. It was hardly surprising then that it should be subject to such overwhelming firepower. Throughout his term, throughout his terms uh, as president, Reagan attempted to implement the California welfare blueprint at a federal level, but for various reasons he was never successful in pushing through the radical reforms he had envisaged. It was under President Clinton, the new Democrat who promised to end welfare as we know it, that the neoliberal neoconservative alliance on welfare reform would ultimately come to fruition. The players that shaped Clinton's welfare reform were not necessarily the same. Among the neoconservatives, only Moynihan would continue to play a direct role in social policy. Their social conservative perspective on welfare reform would find new expression in the paternalism of Lawrence Mead, the leading exponent of, of workfare, and the communitarianism of the Institute for American Values, exponents of marriage promotion and family law reform. And although Milton Friedman continued to play a role as a public intellectual, his early policy influence was now channeled through a dense network of policy think tanks, ranging from the Libertarian, the Cato Institute, to the Neoliberal and Social Conservative, the American Enterprise Institute, the Manhattan Institute, the Heritage Foundation. Under Clinton, under Clinton, these figures would help shape a new era of social policy that unambiguously placed family values at the heart of welfare reform.